So yeah, my name is Stephen Jones. Good evening. Um, I'm a psychologist and uh, by education also a sports scientist. And I currently work as a neurofeedback therapist in, um, in a medical practice here in the center of Munich. Um, as the word neurofeedback would imply, um, we're working with uh, processes within the brain that we're trying to influence in a positive way by generating feedback about them um, to improve certain in the brain's regulation, brain self-regulation. So, first question, by show of hands, how many of you have heard of neurofeedback? That's quite a few, that's good. That's sort of what I was expecting, about almost maybe 60-40%. <laughs> so, uh, so, let's go and take a look what it actually is. Um, very simply put, it's an EEG technique for training um, the regulation of unconscious activities in the brain. So what we do is we place electrodes on the scalp. As you can see, our, our volunteer has, has one on the back of his head here. You maybe can't see them so well from there. Um, and we measure the electrical activity that goes on on the top layer of our brain, which is sent through an amplifier um, to a screen that you can see over there. Um, and we basically see the EEG, which is, you know, first of all, a bunch of lines. Um, and we try and generate feedback about this activity, right? So um, the most basic form would be to say, okay, we show the person the lines and say, improve them. That won't work very well, though. So what we use um, is uh, music, videos, or games that are based on um, a threshold that re and react to um, the activity. So every time a certain activity um, goes below the threshold, uh, sorry, above the threshold, um, we reward our client or our patient. For example, by the music getting louder or the video, as in this example, getting bigger. And every time it's below the threshold, the music will get quieter and smaller. So we're rewarding positive behavior in the brain, basically. Um, you may have heard of operant conditioning. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's, it's based on that. Um, so why do we think this is important? Why do we do it? Here you can see the number of lost working days um, per 100 employees over the last 20 years. And you can see it's, it's tripled over 20 years. And we do suspect that there's a much larger dark figure, obviously because people don't like to talk about psychological problems, um, as it's often seen as a weakness, unfortunately. And um, so we also see people who come to us and won't tell us what's wrong with them. They'll say, yeah, I want to have neurofeedback training. But three or four weeks later, they'll start opening up and telling us about problems they may have. So that's why we suspect that these numbers aren't quite um, accurate. So that's why we, uh, we believe you need to find a way to interact with the brain rather than just handing out pills that you know, uh, help with the symptoms but don't actually solve the problem. Um, so can your feedback solve the problem? Well, it's not a magical cure. It's been around for half a century and um, it, you know, it hasn't managed to break through completely yet. But it is a very useful tool in sort of treating the symptom severity, um, treating comorbid symptoms, um, and also for, for just improving the quality of life and, and general well-being. I mean, we all go to the gym because we know physical activity is going to make us feel better, it's going to make us more healthy, we're probably going to have longer lives, and we're going to prevent certain issues when we're older. So why not we do the same for the brain? And that's pretty much what we're trying to do here. We're trying to train the brain to have a more healthy uh, regulation. So let's go into, um, into a bit more detail of how it works. This is an EEG. Um, you may have seen this if you've ever visited a, a neurologist. Um, there are 19 channels here. Um, there are 19 different points on our head. Um, and as you can see, at the same time, we have different types of activity depending on the location. Um, and it's when, we ha when the, the, um, these patterns l fall out of balance that symptoms start to occur. So let's just go and have a look exactly what we're measuring here, though, what, what these lines actually mean in the brain. So this is a neuron. Um, and we have the, the line underneath is a, is a, a so-called action potential. Some of you may, may, not, may have heard of this in school, may remember it from, from biology classes. Um, a neuron has a resting potential of minus, uh, about minus 70 um, microvolts. And 
when there's a certain exchange in, in positively and negatively charged molecules, what happens is um, an action potential is, is um, created. That means that the cell suddenly depolarizes, and you get sort of a line like this if you measure it with one electrode. Um, anyway, it's just a picture of a cell, basically. So we have positively charged molecules, negatively charged new, uh, molecules inside and outside the cell. They're constantly changing, and for whatever reason, you know, um, the the the, um, the the sudden increase within the cell or outside the cell, and then you see this action potential. That's basically what we're measuring. So it's electrochemical processes, basically. So we'll skip that slide. Um, and back, to so we go back to the brain waves. Um, we work with two features in your feedback on EEG generally, I guess. Um, we have the amplitude, which is the height of the brain wave, um, measured in microvolts. And that represents the strength, so the number of neurons doing exactly the same thing at the same time on a certain location. And we have the frequency which we work with, which is the speed of the brain waves. So um, that's measured in hertz, it's the number of cycles per second. And um, based on the frequency, we can separate or divide the, the raw EEG into um, frequency bands, as you can see here. So you can see at the bottom we have the delta uh, activity, which are slower waves and larger amplitudes. This is something that we measure predominantly when we're asleep. Um, and for example, if we're sort of concentrating, working hard on an exam, or, or, or just at work focused uh, very strongly, we have lots of high beta waves. Um, the faster the ones with a smaller amplitude. And that's a good thing. We need these brain waves for different mental states that we're in. Um, it's just when we have the um, certain frequencies at the, at the wrong location, I guess, or, or, or location that we don't want to see them over a long period of time is that we have when we have problems. But just to make this whole thing a little bit more clear, this is why I've, I've hooked up our, our volunteer here. Um, let's go into a quick demonstration. So this is what you're going to see in a second. I'll just have to walk over here um, to change a few things. But I'll, I'll just show you over here right now. Um, so here you can see well, this white line is the, um, the raw EEG. All the frequencies are contained in here. We filtered out the alpha. You'll see why in a second for demonstration purposes. And that's the alpha um, amplitude it represents. And here we also have the alpha amplitude. Now we want to reward the, um, the alpha activity every time it goes b above a certain threshold, which is here, this little arrow. I don't know if you can't see it as well at the back. There's a small arrow here. And every time the brain activity goes above the alpha, this number here, which is the percentage of time above threshold, will go up. And in the case of the game that I'm going to show you in a second, the monk will also react to it. So I'll just switch screens quickly. So if I walk around. And click that. So this would be the game. So every you can see the monk's going, sort of is quite low right now, but he's going um, up and down a little bit. Um, and that's the reaction to, to his brain activity. So if I ask our volunteer now, to close your eyes, just for a couple of seconds. Now you can see the monk rising up very quickly. And that's the alpha activity suddenly shooting up. That's a healthy, normal reaction to when we close our eyes. So that's good. <laughs> so we go back, <laughs> go back to the screen here. So just close your eyes one more time. Um, yeah, you, you, you can see the alpha you know, shooting up the top of this thermometer now. Um, yeah, so, so that's basically what we work with. And over time, the brain learns to adopt this, this pattern in everyday life. Um, so back to the brain waves. This is very simplified, but it gives sort of a rough idea of how it works. The slower wave are, are present or dominant when we're more calm, and the faster ones, as we get more stressed and, and or more focused or concentrated on things. Um, it's important, though, to understand that um, all these frequencies happen parallel. There's no good waves or bad waves. They're all happening at the same time, and it's the dominance that varies. So what we tend to see, a uh, very um, uh, concrete example, would be burnout. In burnout, people, when people suffer burnout, often it's work-related, and they're working their 12-hour days, six days a week, week after week, month after month. So they're using the front part of the brains and um, generating a lot of this high beta activity, which they need. But if it's constantly there, the brain starts to make that the new normal regulation. So they, they're not able to switch off anymore and relax. So with those people, we try and switch, turn things around or teach them, train them to switch 
be able to switch off their brain waves and to control and regulate their brain waves more consciously. Um, this is a, a, an example of one of our, our patients. Ah, something's happened here. Okay, it's supposed to be delta, theta, alpha, gamma, uh, alpha, beta, gamma. Um, this is typical for depression. This is a so-called quantitative EEG. Um, it, it's, it's a uh, resting EEG of a whole brain, of a, the 19 electrodes or 19 points that I showed you earlier. Um, and it, we compare the, 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 the EEG to a, a large database. And it sort of shows you, compared to the database, how many standard deviations or how do you compare to what we'd expect in a healthy person of that age and that gender. Um, so red is, means we have too much of something compared to what we'd expect, and blue is too little. Um, so here we see lots of too, too much theta, too much alpha, and too much beta, particularly in the frontal areas, and that would suggest um, the theta is, is um, associated with anxiety, for example. Alpha is associated with, um, uh, with in the frontal areas with lack of focus, lack of concentration, and the high beta would be, you know, constant stress, basically, or circling thoughts, which we see in depression. So with this person, we did about two months of training, it was a, and he, he asked us if we could do another quantitative EEG, which we don't always do. We're trying to do more and more now to sort of generate more evidence um, for what we do. And we saw something like this. SMR training, that j just basically means that we're training the theta down whilst we're training some more um, relaxing frequencies up. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but we're basically training theta down and would also add an alpha training as well. So we'd train the alpha down in the frontal areas and then you end up with a picture like this at the bottom. So there's a, a great improvement here. And you know, this, this often matches what the people are telling us as well when they come and see us. After certain, no, well, surprisingly, it, it doesn't go back so quickly, no. The, the effects are lasting once you reach the state. So we do recommend that the people come back to us for like a, another boost session. But um, yeah, it, it, the, the effects are pretty, pretty good and pretty lasting. So who is neurofeedback for? We say it's for everyone. So I talked to you about the patient just now, but we also see lots of businessmen you know, top managers who are stressed all the time and we try and sort of um, do relaxation trainings with them or concentration trainings, focus trainings to increase productivity. So that's more of a preventative um, training. However, we are working towards um, taking this into health management um, and we have some big projects going on there. Um, it's nothing new to the world of sports. It's been around for decades and particularly in, in the field of golf, it, it's a... It's a very been a very useful tool because you know, when they're putting, they have to be focused in the moment, and every movement has to be, um, um, you know, carried out carefully. And there are some interesting studies there as well, if, if you're interested. Um, we see a lot of students who come to us who have difficulty taking exams uh, because they they get nervous, and, and even though they've learned everything, they fail. So we'll combine the the neurofeedback with example questions, perhaps from the exam, and just go through it with them. Um, and we also see artists. Um, so we have a project going on with um, classical musicians in Augsburg. Um, it's surprising how competitive it is. If you've gone through the whole classical training in music, the classical music training, um, you end up competing against 500 other people for one job in, in an orchestra. And you have to audition so you're playing you know, behind a curtain so they don't even see your face whilst they're playing. Um, so they need to be able to perform in the moment. And we actually received feedback from one of, um, one of the people we were doing a study with saying that um, he got a job and he says it's only due to neurofeedback that he was able to perform. And that might be a, a slightly extreme statement. I mean, I wouldn't say we can, as I said earlier, we can't cure everything, but he associated it with the neurofeedback, which is a very positive thing. So it's definitely a, a helping tool. So that's pretty much um, about neurofeedback itself, uh, 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 like the, the, the basis of neurofeedback, I guess. Now, where do we see the future of neurofeedback? And these are things we're doing at the moment in our practice. We're sort of trying to develop new technology and new methods. And we're working with virtual reality. So we're creating whole environments that will react to your brain activity, which would make the whole experience more intensive. And um, it also takes away the distraction because you are sitting in the room you know, in your chair doing your feedback on a screen, you always have a therapist sitting next to you, <laughs> looking at you and watching you. So this is probably going to, we hope, lead to 
um, stronger effects and a, and a more fun experience. And we also have the mobile training systems that we um, hand out as an addition to the therapy. It doesn't replace therapy, but people are using it at home, for example, maybe to help them sleep. So an hour before going to bed, they might do a neurofeedback training to sort of calm themselves down and then fall asleep easier. Yeah, so that's pretty much neurofeedback in 50 minutes. Um, as said before, there's, there's a break now. You're all welcome to come and have a go and test it out for yourself. Um, yeah, thanks for coming out listening uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. As always, we have times for some questions. And <laughs> so no robotics, the, the goal is to read mind or hmm. the, the one of the things is to read mind in such, such a way that it can be for example, applied for a controlling machine or something, does it have anything in common? I mean, um, there'll be some things in common, but we're not trying to read minds. We're just giving feedback about the brain's activity. And we're using computers to do that. And um, yeah, so that it, it's not quite the same thing. It's not quite the same. But, yeah. So my question was concerning uh, disorders. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is bipolar or other this yeah. sort of disorder, how yeah. can this help? You're right. I, I, I didn't mention this. Okay. So we see a whole range of disorders, and I, sh I showed you the brain map just now. Um, you know the colorful pictures of, of, of the brain of the head, and with different disorders, so like for example, the depression, or with bipolar, or, or a whole range of disorders, you, you come up with very um, with, with the same patterns over and over again. So that based on these pictures, we create a training protocol, so we decide which frequencies are we going to train, at which location on the brain, and then, um, yeah, we just work towards it. But it's not, it's not sort of like a psychotherapy, we're not, we're not talking through their problems, it's more of a, a, a training. We, we call it a training rather than therapy, um, to keep it positive, but yeah, it's... Uh, what I'm trying to understand is, like, when you're saying training, yeah. uh, Yeah. Yeah. In general, this is more of an, uh, an addition to a treatment they already have, and it just sort of helps that. So it doesn't replace other treatments for serious disorders. It's, it's an addition for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, from this side, yes, you are on the back. What do you mean by fix externally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically what we're doing. So we're rewarding the frequencies or the amplitude of the frequencies that we want to see in a healthy functioning brain. No, no, no we don't generate frequency. No, no, we're just measuring. The fre we're measuring the frequency in the brain and we're feeding that back. That's all we're doing. It, it's much more simple than it. So stimulating the brain, you mean? That's possible in theory, but we, we don't do that. Uh, I have done it in the past, but that's not what we do. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, and then after that. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, um, when people come to us dep with depression, they're in treatment in, with a psychiatrist. Uh, we, 
this isn't replacing other forms of therapy. It's an, it's an addition to what, to what um, is already being done. Um, the thing is, the typical person who calls us with depression is someone who um, has been gone through all the medication and we know it's trial and error process until you find the one that works for you and they say it's just not working and they want to try something different and then they come to us uh, we, 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 also have a, we have a doctor in the practice as well uh, <laughs> who I work for um, and um, you know so we do also contact the people who are already treating them is it so we, we are very careful with this and being very responsible <laughs> with our training. Okay, I have to cut the discussions because I promised yeah. <laughs> him to get the questions, but Stephen is also yeah. available during the break. I would like to understand the feedback part mm -hmm. because uh, I, I, as far as I understood, it's, it's usually uh, so yeah. the people who come for training <laughs> graphs or what, what is the feedback they are giving? No, no the, the feedback can be a game, it can be a film. It can be music. We always combine it with music or sound of some kind. So they've got the visual and the auditory. In theory, it can be anything you can feel. It could be, you know, a, a chair, a massaging chair that vibrates in theory. You just got to generate some sort of feedback that reacts to the, the, to the threshold that you're going over, right, or below. That's pretty much how it works. And, yeah. Does that make them addictive to the... No. <laughs> no. Okay, thank you everyone and thank you Stephen no one problem. more time. Thank you.